Hey guys, welcome back to Stories with a Stoner. Hey, I am your resident stoner. This is Julie. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Um, yeah, so if you are a returning subscriber, guest, visitor, whatever, thank you. Thank you for coming back. Um, if you're new to this channel, hi and welcome. Um, so a little bit about what we do here is I am a costume embellisher. I'm a stoner. Um, I like to take costumes. I do design. Um, I don't sew. I hate sewing. And um, when I do sew, it's very painful. So that's why I've like really sped this section up because it's just me trying to sew in a skirt. Um, so yeah. So what I do is I I record wh while whilst I am making costumes. I do record, um, and then I will overlay this audio. Um, where I read inspirational stories, inspirational, just anything that inspires us. Because, I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> Who's going to lie and say we don't need inspiration from time to time? Don't look around the room, but raise your hands. <clears throat> so, yes. Yeah, so, I take the costuming videos and I time-lapse them um, <laughs> uh, even faster again even faster when I'm trying to sew. Um, yeah. And we are reading, um, a book, Sheep Ears, uh, by author Sherry Witt. Um, and it's just a, sh a collection of true impacting short stories about listening to the good shepherd and doing his will. Um, we are in chapter 19 and, um, you know, I highly recommend you going back and listening to some of her previous stories, but I do want to say, I think this chapter is my number one, number one favorite chapter. Um, it is kind of like, um, mm, mm. she goes through and gives three, um, like examples of one of her children's type A personality and like how she dealt with it and what she did. And um, the third, what did, what did she exactly call them? The third example, third incident um, guys, I don't know if I would have had the will to follow through with this. Um, but it worked. It worked for her family, and I'm really happy it did. Okay, so I know I've been yapping a lot. Um, I will list in the description a link to her book because each chapter has a, um, kind of like an inter introspective uh, set of questions for you that kind of is like a, a nice journaling experience, kind of helping you explore yourself, um, kind of a what would you do. And then she does give some of her answers and some scriptural references for you um, just to kind of like help explain why she answered what she did or why maybe you should think about that answer a little bit more or differently or how to incorporate it with you. Um, there are no right or wrong answers um, because it's you uh, and everyone is different. We're all snowflakes. Um, I have opted to not um, read out the questions and um, give you my answers. I did in the first couple of chapters and I don't, I don't think you guys really wanted to know me that well. Um, so without uh, further ado, I do want to say that this is one of the longer chapters. So stick with me, guys. Stick with me because I promise you, you're going to want to hear how the third example turned out between her children. <clears throat> so here we go. Uh, Sheep Ears, chapter 19. Have you ever dealt with a type A personality? That's the chapter, but I do want to say yes, because I am type A. So I deal with myself every day, and so does my loved ones. Okay, let's get in. Dogs each have different personalities. Some dogs are docile, some needy, some hyper, some dominant. If these characteristics are left unchecked, they could become major problems in a household. If you've ever seen the television show The Dog Whisperer, you'll know what I am. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you've ever seen the television show, The Dog Whisperer, you'll know what I mean. Uh, when Caesar Milan helps a family with their dog problem, 
He emphasizes the fact that the owners are usually the problem because they don't understand how to how to deal with their dog's personalities. Disclaimer, I am a horrible reader. I do read these chapters in advance now, so I can try to do a little bit of a better job, but <clears throat> I'm still not the best. Um, okay. I am talking about dogs because, as a dog owner, that's the best way I can explain a type A personality. Type A personalities are dominant, strong-willed. An alpha dog rules the house and intimidates everyone else. This might be a simplification, but it basically, but it is basically how a type A personality acts. According to an online encyclopedia, Wikipedia, the type A and type B personality theory was developed in the 1950s by cardiologist Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman. 1950s, wow. <clears throat> okay. People with a type A personality are often high achieving workaholics who multitask, push themselves with deadlines, and hate delays and ambivalence. Their behavior is expressed in three major symptoms. <laughs> okay, three major symptoms free floating hostility. Check. A competitive drive. Check. And in three, oh, oh, my bad. Okay, I totally flubbed that because I was doing checks for myself. Let me start that over. The behavior ex is expressed in three major symptoms, free-floating hostility, a competitive drive, and an achievement-driven mentality. Check. In contrast, type B personalities generally live a lower stress level. When faced with competition, they do not mind losing and either enjoy the game or back down. In the workforce, type A personalities are the go-getters, the kind of people corporations seek out. They are the lawyers, the office managers, the salesmen of high-profile medical devices. Businesses thrive on them because they are earth shakers. But what are these people like as children? Who would want to deal with a hostile, competitive, achievement-driven child at home, in school, or on a basketball court? Combine the type A personality with hormones, and you have, as the kids say, a hot mess. That's what our household felt. Paul was my type A personality. I always knew he was different from anyone else in our family. I remember one incident when he was two years old. His brothers, ages five and seven, were playing soccer in the backyard, and I was on a ladder filming them. Paul screamed, me want to play. They told him, you're too little, which made him even more furious. After bantering back and forth with them, Paul darted straight for the ball, tapped it away with his foot, got control, and dribbled it around the yard, his head thrown back laughing while they tried to catch him. Ha 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 ha. That's, that's what I heard in my head. I stopped filming and just watched. I could tell you of many more incidents, but suffice to say, he always took charge. I had to spend a lot of time corralling his free spirit. I even set Aaron and Nathan down once and apologized for having to devote so much of my time to Paul. He was different and required a lot of handling. By the time he turned 12, I guess you could say our household was a full-fledged hot mess. I didn't go to the dog whisperer. I went to God, the child whisperer. I thought my husband and I must have made mistakes with Paul. I prayed, God, I don't know what to do. Please give me guidance. I know his spirit doesn't need to be broken, but God, I know you'll never be pleased with Paul unless things get under control. God asked, do you trust me? I said, yes, God, I trust you. Then let me have him. I pretended that I had Paul in my hands and I threw him up to God. I said, God, do what you want with him because I am at my the end of my rope. But I knew I had to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. 
Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes, while God worked in his young life. Psalms chapter 37, verse 7, NIV. So over the next year and a half, Paul went to the school of hard knocks. God orchestrated three important events events in his life. I hurt for him because I saw him hurting, but I knew God was at work molding him into the man he wanted Paul to become. Incident one. Paul had a classmate named Brandon who had sort of a redneck gang. They didn't have guns or anything. They were just big guys who, for their age, wait, big guys for their age with bully mentalities. Someone told Brandon that Paul had made fun. Or I'm sorry. Ugh. Someone told Paul. Oh my goodness. I made it even worse. Oh my. Oh, <clears throat> so sorry. Here we go. I'm going to do better. I promise. Someone told Brandon that Paul had made some ugly remarks about Brandon's girlfriend. One afternoon, Brandon went into the mall with his friends. When Brandon and his buddy saw Paul there, they started running after him with a slew of profanities. They chased him through the mall and out the door. Thank goodness Paul had some speed because he ran the mile home in record time. They were much slower, so they never caught up to him. That's all that happened, but it kept him from going to the mall for a year. Paul claimed that he had never said anything about Brandon's girlfriend, but just like Joseph in the Bible, he still had to flee for his 12-year-old life. Incident 2. When Paul was in the 7th grade, he played in a basketball league that consisted of 7th, 8th, and 9th graders. In one game, he made a three-pointer right over the outstretched hands of another player, John. That was bad enough, but Paul also gave John one of his in-your-face haughty grins that said, "Mm, that's right, I'll do it every time, sucker. It was just a look, but that was all it took. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, verse 18, AB. I saw the look, and John saw the look. But most importantly, God saw the spirit of the look. Paul had gotten overconfident and edged over the line into arrogance. From that moment on, Paul was a hunted man by John and his crew. They were the preppy type. When they played soccer against each other in the local recreational league, they would aim for Paul, not the ball. He told me that they doubled up behind him and said, You'd better watch your back because we're coming for you. There were lots of curse words peppered in that threat or in the threats. When Paul entered eighth grade and they were in the 10th grade, I had to drop him off at school exactly when the bell rang because they would sometimes leave their campus and patrol his school trying to hunt him down. I would be waiting at the curb when school was over, ready to pick him up immediately so he would avoid their wrath. Paul would come in and say, Mom, we have to move. We can't live here anymore. I told him that wasn't an option. My heart ached for him or for my son. I prayed for him. I knew that look hadn't been worth all this torment. However, I had given Paul to God, and I was confident that he was teaching Paul in a way that I never could. Finally, about a year and a half later, Paul walked in into the house and said, Mom, get the Bible out. See what it says. I can't live like this anymore. My heart leapt. I knew that God would bring his trouble to a close now that Paul was seeking him. I asked God for his wisdom. Paul, I am not going to find the scriptures. You are. But mom, I don't know where anything is. Just open the Bible and read out loud, I replied. I had no idea what he would turn to, but God had given me his direction. Paul read from Jeremiah 26. It went something like this. Bad things will happen to you because of your evil heart. 
I have sent people to warn you and you haven't listened. This and more will happen if you don't repent. If you repent, I will cancel the punishment against you. He looked up wide eyed and so did I. God didn't mince his words, I said. Or I'm sorry, God didn't mince his words. I said, Paul, what do you think that means? He needed to figure it out for himself. Slowly and with a lot of thought, he said, I think I need to go to John and apologize. Whew, what a revelation. I called John's mom and told her what had been happening. She'd had no idea about the things that had been going on. She promised that it wouldn't happen anymore, and I said it wouldn't be necessary to speak face to face. I explained that Paul wanted to apologize in person. She said she would talk to her husband and call me back later. Eventually, she called to say her husband was bringing John over to our house. I had met her husband before. He was about 6'3 and kind of looked like the Hulk. I'm sure to Paul he looked more like Goliath. While we were waiting for them to arrive, Paul got a little nervous. Mom, what am I going to say? Help me! Tell John that you know why he is mad, that he is right, to, that he has a right to be upset, and that you don't blame John or his buddies for following you around. Tell them you learned your lesson and want to ask for their forgiveness. And Paul said exactly what I had advised him to say. John's dad asked, John, what do you think? Do you forgive him? John thought about it for a second and then said, yes. I do. What about your buddies? Are you going to call them off too? His dad asked. Yes, it won't ever happen again. And it didn't. Paul looked about seven feet tall to me that day. He did what many grown-ups fail to do in their lifetimes. He swallowed his pride and asked for forgiveness. Incident three. Okay, y'all, I'm going to take a break. I mean, break in and say, just listen. This is my favorite one. Okay, <clears throat> incident three. A couple of months after incident two began, things came to a head at our house. For the umpteenth time, Paul was ragging on Nathan, our type B middle son. You're sorry, you can't touch me. I'm too fast for you. You're weak. All of this was said in front of Paul's friend, Michael. They both laughed at Nathan. I heard the remarks and fussed at Paul. Nathan went to his room in a grievous, grievous silence. And Paul and Michael left to ride their bikes. I went to my swing outside and started talking to God. Please tell me what to do. I've paddled Paul. I've grounded him. And I've talked to him until I am blue in the face. There's got to be a solution. God said, there is. Let him fight. Are you serious? Nathan is too big. It won't be a fair fight. Exactly. God gave me specific instructions about how to carry out his plan. Just as in Palms, Psalms, Palms, <laughs> Psalms, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Psalms 32, verse 8. N-A-S-B. I thought, God, I sure hope you're right. First, I talked to Nathan. I asked for his forgiveness for letting the situation get out of hand. I could see the relief on his face, and when I told him that God had given me instructions and shocked... So sorry. Uh, let me restart that. Um... I could see the relief in his face when I told him that God had given me instructions and shock as I outlined the plan and told him there were to be no broken bones or hits to the face. Nathan isn't a violent, pers a violent person anyway. I had to talk him into doing it. He reluctantly agreed. As soon as Paul and Michael returned and walked into the door, I asked Paul to come sit down. He had his usual smirk on his face. Paul, you're always telling Nathan how great you are, how you're stronger and faster than him. Well, 
I'm going to give you a chance to prove it today. What are you talking about? He exclaimed. I'm going to let you and Nathan fight. That's crazy. He's bigger than me. At age 15, Nathan was 5'9". Paul, at age 12, was 5'2". What does that matter? Are you scared? You're always saying you can beat him. Here's your chance. Paul yelled, Mom, what are you doing? I looked at Michael and said, Does it look to you like he's scared? Michael nodded. Sure does. At, at that, Paul scowled. Mm, okay, I'll fight. God had impressed me to go to all the neighbors beforehand and inform them of what was going to happen. I didn't want anyone to call the police. I picked my friend's yard for the fight because it had soft grass and no trees. Michael and I stood on the sidewalk, and Nathan and Paul went to the center of the ring. I had a feeling some of the neighbors were peeking through their curtains, but I wasn't sure. I explained the rules. They had one and a half minutes to fight, and they had to stay in the perimeter of the yard. Paul didn't know that I had given Nathan the rule about no face hitting, no broken bones. I looked at my watch. Get ready. Get set. Go. Paul ran as fast as he could to the driveway, and I called time out. Hey, what are you doing? No running. You got to stay in there and fight. That's no fair. He's bigger than me. But you keep saying you can whoop him. Now fight. You have one minute and 28 seconds. I looked at my watch, shouted, go. And they started again. Nathan grabbed Paul by the arm and flung him to the ground. Paul yelled, ow, that hurt. Again, I called time out. What's wrong? That hurt. And nothing. Okay, one minute, 25 seconds left. Get ready. Or ready, set, go. Nathan stood there waiting for Paul to strike. He said, hit me, Paul. Hit me. Paul made a half jab and Nathan once again grabbed Paul and slung him to the ground. Ow, that hurt, Paul yelled indignantly. This time, it was Nathan who called a timeout. Mom, I'm through. That's enough. But you still have a minute and 20 seconds left. You need to finish this. No, Mom, no more, was Nathan's response. Paul and I sat down on the swing, and Nathan stood as I gave my speech. Paul, from now on, any time Nathan hears anything negative from you, he gets one minute and 20 seconds back in the ring with you. All he has to say is, Mom, I need my time back. And he's got it. Do you fully understand that? Yes, ma'am. Nathan, do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then we're done. They shook hands, and as they walked off, I said, Now remember, Paul, he has, I know, Mom, a minute and 20 seconds. This time, there was no smirk on his face. Only time would tell if Paul had gotten the point. Everything went pretty well for about a month. Then one day, I heard Paul getting revved up again. I hollered to Nathan from the other room. Nathan, do you want your one minute and 20 seconds? I heard Paul say, never mind. And that was the, that was the end of it. The minute and 20 seconds was never mentioned again. Things changed in our household. Paul now respected Nathan, not because he started the fight, but because he had ended it. I believe Paul saw superiority does not come from physical strength, but from mental meekness. I've heard meekness defined as strength under control. That was Nathan. I call him my quiet thunder. I really admired Nathan that day. I had no idea idea what would happen, but God knew. He looked in Nathan's heart and saw forgiveness and mercy. Nathan forgave me for not correcting the problem sooner. He also showed mercy to Paul. God knew that Nathan could be trusted. 
when Jesus erupted in anger and overturned the tables in the loan of the loan sharks, doing trade at the temple in Jerusalem, he was making a point. Don't abuse God's temple. And that day in my neighbor's front yard, God and that day in my neighbor's front yard, God had a message. Paul, don't abuse your brother. Oops, I just dropped my bookmark. So sorry. <laughs> um, point made. Nathan was Paul's best man at his wedding. Paul was Nathan's best man in his wedding and also the godfather to Nathan's beloved son, Ethan. Amazing. Nathan told me that he had talked to Paul about the incident 14 years later. Nathan had been remorseful and apologized for the fight. Guess what Paul said? I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even remember. I know he must have remembered, but that was just his way of saying the matter was forgiven and forgotten. When we have transgressed against God and sought forgiveness, when we apologize once more, that is his reply. I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even remember. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, NASB. Thank you, Jesus. Paul went to the school of hard knocks mentally and physically. It was hard on me, and it was hard on him. If you met him now, you would you would think, what an awesome yet humble guy. It would have been easy back then to rescue him from those hardships, but would his lessons have been learned? Probably not. I'm not saying this same method will work for everyone. I am saying that it is important to seek God. He has the answers to your problems. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, NIV. But you'd better be willing to let go and let God do his work. When he asks you to step up, do so even if it's hard. You will be amazed by the results, just as I am amazed by my type A son now under control and my meek type B son redeemed. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Psalms chapter 34, verse 22 in KJV. Yea and amen. So I don't know about you guys, but I I just love that incident three. And I can just imagine both Nathan and Paul in the front yard, just swinging elbows. I mean, I, I just, no, I can't. Um, Because I know Paul, um, and I know Nathan, and I um, also know Aaron and and the author, Sherry, and her husband, Randy. And I don't see Nathan ever, you know, confronting someone like that. But, I mean, I do understand that that is what um, it was going to take to get Paul to have a little bit of um, control over his... um, to, to have control over his personality. And I get it. So anywho, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Yes, I am still sewing. I hate sewing. I am still sewing on this white and purple costume. And I do think that next chapter, um, I will be stoning. Ah. So um, again, um, if you haven't subscribed, uh, go ahead and do that and smash that like button. Leave me a comment if you enjoyed what you see, what you hear. Um, Yeah. So I hope you guys come back. Um, As always, I hope that you guys sparkle on, but be kind as you do it. Bye.